Greetings, Nick Bogart with Sweetwater. I'm here with this gentleman. Street I think line. you recognize him. I think you might recognize him. I've had the honor of knowing this gentleman for now 24 years, believe it or not. That's you, when, you count? It's a long time. Yeah, it's when we did that first Marshall Amp that's still on the stage, the 2555 yeah, SL, yeah. so they hold up. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I, uh, I'm surprised that they, they sound as good now as they did way back when. What a concept. Yeah. So, and the funny thing is, the more things change, the more things stay the same. I mean, your rig is still essentially, it's well, number one, it's you, then it's your Les Pauls, yeah. your Duncans, we haven't Marshalls really changed much of anything, you know. Um, I just never, I, there, I mean, I've been using, basically, I've been uh, going after the same kind of thing out of a Marshall, and over the years, I found that there's certain things that, that work with Marshalls that get the sound that I want to get. So I sort of stick with that, and then, you know, I, I go through a lot of Les Pauls, always end up going back to certain ones, you know, that are tried and true or whatever. Right. But there's not a lot else going on. Yeah, it's just always your Duncan's pretty much. Yeah, nice Seymour has been consistent. And, and how many, of course, your wah, which is part yeah. of your trademark, it, but you sometimes use it very subtly. It's not just, it's not just, um, it's not just the uh, shaft theme. You're doing some pretty right. cool I, although stuff. Although I do enjoy the, the shaft theme. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the only effect that I really like to use because it's manual. Right. And I mean, I, I like the voice box too, but that is such a specific sound gotcha. that you can't use it all the time. So uh, the wobble pedal is the one pedal that sort of consistently works in tandem with your emotional sort of ebb and flow. Right. Yeah, it's very vocal, obviously, yeah. duh. Yeah. But I like the way you sometimes would just leave it slightly cocked yeah. for certain things. So, yeah, it's just it's it's great for sustain if you can find that right spot. Right, yeah. right, right. And you use pretty heavy strings, eleven through forty eight. So yeah. a lot of people use heavy bottom but not heavy top. Yeah. When you're what, eleven, fourteen, eighteen and you bend a lot. Do you have to keep your hand strength up to do that? Um well yeah, I, I mean I play a lot. That's yeah. that's the main thing, you know. Um I find that when as soon as we have a break and I'm off for you know any period of time, I can play at home all the time, even with those strings. But when the way that you play live is so different than you play anywhere else, right. that I start to work back up to that place where I can, you know, play for three hours straight and, and not break a sweat as far as this, you know, <laughs> hand strength is concerned. Now, what makes yeah. the difference live? Is it just adrenaline and feeding off the audience or feeding off the band? Um, I think the the um, the thing, I don't know, it, when you're playing live for me is I'm just immersed in what I'm doing. So you really, you're really sort of in, super involved with every chord change, with every um, single note. You know, I mean, you really, I change right. things around, but it's also very much flying by the seat of your pants. So there's a lot of improv going on. And that's something that's so spontaneous and in the heat of the moment that it's exciting and right. you learn a lot of new every single night you come up with stuff you because you, you're thinking you know like you're hearing stuff in your head and you're moving really quickly and there's a lot going on and when you pull it off you might retain it for the next day or you might remember it for go oh that was really cool I've never done that before or you just experiment whatever it doesn't have the same kind of urgency when you're at home or in the studio doing right. it it just does not work the same way talking to the studio how different is your setup in the studio is it the same kind of deal it's pretty much the same you know half stack and a les paul and a gotcha. wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah for the most part and the last album living the dream which mm. is great by the way thanks you recorded that kind of live didn't you with the band always yeah you, i mean the, the main thing is to capture that sort of feel of a band actually working you know the synergy of it working together as right. a unit um, and then you can go back and do whatever overdubs you want to do, but the, the most important thing is to capture that sort of live integrity. Right, and you get that by people playing at the same time. Yeah, yeah you can't yeah. get it yeah, off I mean, the tape, can you? With, with the advent of of computer technology, a lot of people. I mean, it is so convenient. I can understand people going, "Oh, wow, this is so exciting! I can be here, and he can be there, and this and that and the other." And the, and what it does, if, as far as rock and roll is concerned, I can't say for pop music. You know, right. you can get away with it. With it's all vocals, and the rest of the stuff is is usually aren't even players anyway. But for a rock band, what happens is it gets so diluted and it loses any kind of sort of emotional impact or that, that tension, all that stuff. And so people are wondering why records sound so bad, but they're not 
recognizing that the recording technique has changed so much, that's what's doing it. Um, I think kids are picking up on it now, but yeah. there was a big period there where it was like, oh, this is just so easy, and we tweak everything with Pro Tools, and we put it all together, and we make it perfect, and it doesn't have the same soul, anywhere near the same soul as rock records that we sort of sort of cut our teeth on, and everybody wonders why, and that's it's as simple as that. It's just people not you know, sort of playing in the moment together. Yeah, playing in the same room at the same yeah, time. Yeah. What a concept. Yeah, because you... Like, That's what rock a rock band is. Yeah. It's a bunch of guys or girls, whatever, you know, playing together and, and sort of working off each other. And, and there's a communicate, you know, unsaid communication going on and that spontaneity that happens. Yeah, and sometimes you don't have... It's not even eye contact. You can feel it. Mm. You can feel it in the air, but you can't yeah. get that from the tape. Oh, a lot of time, yeah. It's, it's not eye contact. It's actually working with some people as a sense of familiarity and getting to know them and... Um, working with good musicians, you start to sort of have this kind of silent communication that goes on that, that can happen without eye contact. Yeah. So what drives you, by the way, because in the 23 years I've known you, I've, this is once again, I'm not meaning to be obsequious, but every time I see you, you seem to be playing better. So you're obviously working really hard on your playing. Is that just an internal thing? I, I would, I, you know, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, I, um, uh, I, you know, all things can say I'm not totally aware of that, but I am working at it all the time. Because you're the, the more you're out there playing, and and sort of like not phoning it in when you're really going for it, you just you just get better at it. You know? Right. And I love what I do, so hopefully I would I would like to think every few years I sort of pick up a little bit of a notch, you know, just from experience, if anything. You know? well, the one thing I love about since, since I've known you, I've watched you play, you've done stuff with B.B. King, you did mm -hmm. stuff with Nile Rodgers and Sheik. Does, do you purposely go outside of your comfort zone? Does that help you? Um, well, I mean, whenever an opportunity arises to play with somebody uh, that you have a huge amount of respect and, you know, and admire what it is that they do musically, um, you know, it's very easy to chicken out of those offers, you know, uh, out of those offers to actually go up and play. So you have to sort of rise to the occasion and go for it because you don't get those opportunities to play with guys like that all the time. So that's, I've been fortunate enough to be able to, to you know, be asked to work with BB or to be asked to work with Nile and other different people that are sort of out of my genre, so to speak. But more importantly, you said yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's the, the trick. So say yes, thing. people. Don't. Now, I've had some sessions where I was, uh, I was in over my head. I, I, a good one was I was working with Ray Charles on. I think about this all the time. I was working with Ray Charles. You worked with Ray Charles. Yeah, I, I recorded on one of his records, and we got to be. I don't know, we were just hanging out for a long time there and we we're doing that Ray movie and he was working with his band in the studio and he had me come in and, and play, right? This is all like real standards, you know, right. jazz standards. And at, at, at that point I was out of my depth because I didn't know the songs, I didn't know any of the chords. They gave me a chord chart and so I sort of learned the chord chart right. and tried to play along with that kind of a thing. But there was, it was not sort of my natural, kind of, you know, jazz has never been really my thing, especially those kind of chords. So right. I was like going, okay, all right. <laughs> so I, I winged it, you know, and I faked it through it, but I'll never forget that experience of, of walking into something where you don't know what you're doing whatsoever. Now, what would your advice be to someone who'd like to follow in some of your footsteps? Because you've had a remarkable career, and part of it, in my opinion, is because you don't quit. I don't. Do you ever take time off? Um, yeah, you know, uh, I yeah, but not big periods of time. Right. I mean, you know, a couple of weeks here, a couple of weeks there. But you still play when you're not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very rarely do I go anywhere without taking a guitar with me. Um, but I mean, I think the, the, the drive factor is just that I really dig what I do and I, I constantly wanting to do it. And the, the other, th the main thing is that it's, it's a live thing, you know, like performing live is what I think is what means the most to me as a guitar player, like right. what I get the most satisfaction out of um, and the challenge of it and all that. Um, and the excitement. I remember when I first started playing, uh, or even before I first started playing, when I was collecting records for all my favorite artists or learning about them or whatever, I would always get their live records yeah. because that to me was what the essence of what it was all about. So um, for me to be able to do what it is that I really want to do, I have to be out touring. Um, making a record is a great creative outlet, but it's really sort of a means to 
go out there and perform whatever your ideas are in front of a, uh, an audience in sort of the heat of the moment. Yeah, so it's the means to the ends, the ends being live yeah. performance. Talking of live performances, that shirt you have, Thin Lizzy, yeah, that's yeah. live and dangerous, what a record. Yeah, because that was one of those records I got Set before I ever got any other Thin Lizzy record. Yeah. So last bit, if you, if you could give a kid, so, or, or someone older, if you could give them two or three sentences of advice with regards getting the most out of their playing, what would that be if that's not a ridiculous question? It, it's not a ridiculous question, but it's a hard question to answer because everybody's different, and I'm still trying to figure out what's the best way to get the most out of what it is that I do when I'm practicing or if I'm you know, jamming in the studio or whatever it is to like really sort of... Uh, uh, sort of get past a certain point. Um, so for other people, it's like it's just perseverance. If find out what you're good at and see what your weaknesses are. Work on your weaknesses. Keep striving on the things that you're good at and perfect that, or however you want to, what, however you want to word it. Not necessarily perfect it, but you know, keep doing what you're doing, and then also add stuff in there that's not necessarily in your comfort zone or whatever. Cool. And I, just work really hard at it. Actually, I lied to you. I have, do have one more question. Hmm. Do you write a lot of great riffs? Do you set time aside to write, or does it just happen when you're playing? I just keep a guitar around. Um, if I sit down and go, I need to write, I won't be able to write anything. Gotcha. As long as I'm not, as long as I keep it casual, um, and I'm just playing my guitar or, you know, the, when ideas come or whatever, and you just sort of let it happen, it, a lot more comes out of that. And then I just always make sure, because you know, the one great thing about computer technology is I can record it on my phone pretty instantaneously. Right. So <laughs> just, so you've got that just in case. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you for it's taking the time. You, great seeing Cheers. you again, my friend. Cheers.